welcome to MedCast Plus. I am your host, Dr. Jack Braha. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Susan Whitley, who is an addiction medicine specialist at New York City Health and Hospitals, Kings County, here in Brooklyn. Welcome to the show, Dr. Whitley. It's really an honor to have you here to talk about addiction medicine. Thank you so much for having me. Well, uh, before we start, tell us a little bit about what does addiction medicine specialty mean? So there are really two ways um, to go into addiction specialty treatment. Some come through psychiatry and some through medicine, but really being an addiction specialist means you've done additional training a year or two to focus on addictions, um, identification and treatment of these disorders, um, and then made a decision to focus in that area. And so after medical school, an interest in addiction medicine, Correct. you decide to go into what we call residency and fellowship. How many years did you spend in training and what kind of training did you do? So I did, uh, I spent about six years total in training. Uh, I did actually both family medicine and psychiatry residencies, followed by a year of additional training um, to become an addiction specialist. So really well-trained, super specialized here in addiction medicine. Uh, where did you go to school and where did you end up training after? Um, I did my medical school outside of the city at George Washington University, but then I, New York native came back to do my um, residency in Manhattan at the Beth Israel Residency Training Program. Um, spent a year in the Bronx doing my addictions fellowship there and uh, worked there for a few years and have been working at uh, New York City Health and Hospitals, Kings County for just coming up on 10 years now. Wow, so uh, Dr. Whitley is our New York native who did most of our training here in New York and is now practicing here in Brooklyn right. at uh, New York City Health and Hospital, uh, Kings County. So, you know, really what we're here today to talk about is the opioid epidemic and, you know, really give us a, a view of what is the state of the opioid overdose problem here in New York City. Right. So I think the reason that we're all here to say we're in the midst of an opioid epidemic is the um, startling overdose death rates. And um, like the whole country, New York City is in the midst of this epidemic. Um, and to put that in perspective, um, the most recent data from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Health estimates that a, a New Yorker is dying almost every six hours from an overdose. Um, that's more than um, motor vehicle accidents, homicides, and other leading causes of death combined. This so is four really people a day are, are, are dying yeah. of, of opioid, and this is a, an epidemic in our city here. And as you said, it's more common than what we would really think of car accidents or, or other types of problems. Mm -hmm. So what is the, you know, the state of affairs? How are we addressing this? What, what are you doing as an addiction specialist and what is the city doing mm -hmm. um, to, to I, you know, take on this, this terrible problem yeah. that we have? Um, the city through the Department of Health and, and certainly where I am at New York City Health and Hospitals is taking this on like full speed ahead. Um, there's a lot of work to identify folks who have opioid use disorders, um, starting from the emergency room or other kind of places where people might enter the medical system, not necessarily for the purpose of seeking help for an addiction, but um, we need to make sure we're asking the right questions, screening for these problems, asking people about substance use, really no matter what the reason is, they're contacting the healthcare system. Um, the second most important thing is, is trying to um, attach people to treatment if they do have a problem. Right. Um, and another important initiative that we can talk, I'd love to talk more about, is overdose prevention. Um, we have extensive efforts um, at our facility and at other programs across the city to distribute naloxone. So and we touched on when people enter our healthcare system, when they get into the mix of things, that screening them, no matter what they showed up for, mm -hmm. whether it's to deliver a baby or maybe they lacerated a finger, to help screen people. What are we doing here in Brooklyn? What are you doing here in Brooklyn that is maybe unique um, to us here and, and at Kings County um, to help with this as well as your naloxone uh, program? So one of the things that's interesting about Brooklyn is we have one of the lower rates um, per population of overdose deaths in New York City. Um, but that, I think, is a little bit misleading because we have the second highest number per year um, of, compared to all the other boroughs. Um, so last year, Brooklyn had about 260, um, 265 overdose deaths in Brooklyn. Um, there are certain neighborhoods that are at higher risk. Um, so places like East New York, Williamsburg, Bushwick, 
uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Crown Heights, um, and also Coney Island have higher than average rates um, of overdoses. Um, overdose of to opioids the rest or of, the city. Of, of all substances? So it, the overdose rates take all substances okay. into account, but about 80% of the overdose deaths do involve opioids. And for so our, we know that's leading right. the charge. And, and for our viewers today, when they hear the word yeah. opioid, you know, maybe they don't understand what that means. We're talking about which drugs here. What are some of the common mm -hmm. names of, of the opioids that we might find on the street or in our, in our prescription pill box yeah. at home? So there are basically two categories, I would say, of opioids. One is the um, sort of heroin and morphine and derivatives of, of those, which are m sort of what we know of as drugs of abuse on the streets. Um, the second big category, as you mentioned, are prescription opioids. Mm -hmm. So these are pills that may be prescribed for pain and become misused for various reasons. Those are things like Percocet, Oxycontin has gotten a lot of press as one of the leading prob you know, problems um, it, with the opioid epidemic as it's unfolded over the last few years. And so these are things that we might even find in our cabinet that was prescribed, say, for someone else or That's for right. us years ago that someone else can get their yeah. hands on. Yes. So these are common drugs. Uh, unfortunately, they've been very commonly used over the last few decades, which led us here. Uh, you mentioned naloxone a little while ago. Uh, talk to us about naloxone and is there a program for naloxone here in Brooklyn like we see advertised in other parts yes. of the country? That's a, um, a great question. Naloxone is an opioid reverser essentially and it's been it's an well, antidote. An antidote that can reverse an overdose on opioids. It's been used um, by emergency health workers and emergency rooms, EMTs, emergency responders, you know, for a very long time. Um, so when they arrive on the scene and someone is um, in an overdose, it can be reversed. Um, what's changed recently is that naloxone can be made available to community members, friends or family members that may be concerned, or just someone who lives in a neighborhood and they think, you know, they might be in a situation where they could encounter someone who's in an overdose. So lay people out there who don't have any medical training exactly. really, and how do they get their hands on the naloxone? So there are various ways that you can get naloxone. One is by um, visiting a registered opioid overdose prevention program, and we at New York City Health and Hospitals Kings County are such a program. Um, so being a patient there and coming in contact with a provider, um, we, can, we can get naloxone into into anyone's hands who is requesting it. The other way is um, at local pharmacies. A participating pharmacy um, can dispense naloxone to anyone who asks, essentially, um, without a prescription. This is by an order from the New York City Health Commissioner um, to make it more readily available to folks who may not be attached to a provider or a program where so they can get that. So if there's a, uh, a pharmacy in the boroughs that is participating by the order, yes. someone could go get naloxone. Now, That's is right. naloxone a pill? Is it an injection? Is it a spray? How, how is it given? So naloxone is available in various ways. The main way that we're just um, getting it out right now is in the form of a nasal spray. So mm -hmm. it's like an allergy medication kind of pump that is mm -hmm. administered through the nose. Um, and that's, I think, one of the easiest ways and quickest ways to get it into somebody who's in need. Now, for, for all of us uh, in, in medicine, we've all used naloxone at one point in our lives, mm -hmm. treating patients, whether we were in the emergency room or uh, elsewhere in the hospital. It's an incredible drug. Tell us a little bit how it's going to work. If someone's going to spray it into a victim who has overdosed for some reason or another, what's going to happen once they spray it? Well, the first thing is important to recognize the signs of an overdose. So that would be someone who is looking very sleepy, maybe breathing slowly. You shake them and they won't wake up. Um, and, um, and then you can administer the naloxone. If that overdose is caused by an opioid, it should be reversed essentially immediately upon giving the medication. Life-saving. Like, yeah, yeah, instantly life-saving. And we do want people to still call 911 and get emergency help. This is no substitute for seeking professional help. This is a life-saving instantaneous treatment to get the patient to further right. care. And in the minutes that it could take for an ambulance to arrive, you can reverse the overdose and, and potentially save a life. So for our viewers today, what are some of the risk factors? Uh, I'll ask it two ways, I guess. What are the risk factors that someone uh, might have that creates addiction? And what are some of the risk factors for overdose? You know, many, many people use opioids in our country for the correct reasons. They just had surgery. Mm -hmm. What are some of the risks that they become addicted to it or, and develop a problem with the drug 
And what are the, some of the risks for overdosing on the drug, uh, really the, the, the worst complication of it? Right. So as far as risk factors for addiction, um, they're not, I don't know, the, they're not specific to opioid addiction, but we know that um, there is definitely a genetic component to risk for addiction. So folks that have family members or multiple family members that have had drug or alcohol problems, we know that their risk for these problems this, are increased. Uh, you know, sorry to interrupt, but this, this for our viewers to realize, this is a disease that people don't choose. It, there's a genetic component to it, just Absolutely. like blood pressure or diabetes. Uh, addiction has a genetic mm -hmm. component. So that's you know, obviously a risk for um, uh, addiction. But what are some of the risk factors for the overdose that we all talk about? So risk factors for overdose include um, using more than one drug mm -hmm. is a common risk factor. I mentioned about 80% of overdose deaths do involve opioids, as far as the last year's data show us. Um, but often they involve opioids mixed with other drugs or alcohol. So things working together to slow the body's respiratory system. Um, one of the main risk factors for opioid overdose also is reduced tolerance. So this is important to know because this could be someone who just came out of treatment just came out of jail, for example, hasn't used drugs for a short period of time, and their tolerance is now lower, and they come back to their neighborhood and their usual lifestyle and use the amount that they were using before they went into that treatment episode or right. that so episode of abstinence. I guess if someone was using eight pills of whatever it is before they went into treatment exactly. because they had built up a tolerance from one to two to six to eight, and they've been off of it for a while, and then they go ahead and take eight pills because that's what I was using before, they're not tolerant anymore and mm -hmm. subsequent an overdose. Right. Yep. And so we, we talked about you know, some of these risk factors for, for overdose. What are some of the things that folks can look out for in their friends or family that they have a problem with opioids or other substances? Well, the, the symptoms of the disease of substance use disorder um, are, are the same for any drug or alcohol for that matter. Um, they have to do with how much and how often the person is using, but more importantly, they have to do with the impact on that person's life. Are they failing to meet their usual social obligations? Are they not showing up for family functions? Or is their work performance suffering in some way? Often there are physical consequences. People are, their mood may change. Maybe they're not sleeping well. Um, and also specific health consequences with opioid um, use. Folks can put themselves at risk for liver infections, HIV, depending on how they're using the drugs. Um, so there often are health consequences as well by the time folks are identified as having a problem. And I know we hear a lot about on TV, as you mentioned before, about oxycodone, which is a pill, but there are multiple ways in which people can use or abuse right. opioids. What are, what are some of the ways or, or some of the substances and how they can use them? Well, with heroin, the drug can often be snorted through the nose or injected in a vein. Um, pills also can be taken by mouth and swallowed, but some people do crush them up and sniff them or mm -hmm. even dissolve them in water and inject them. Those way are ways of sort of increasing your bang for the buck. You get more right. impact from the drug by injecting versus swallowing it through your mouth.